good morning. Uh, welcome to Bar and Bob's Banknote <laughs> chat, as is this becoming a regular thing nowadays. Um, today we are talking about the New York sale, which we hold in January. We had a very good um, sale last year, the Andean collection of South American paper, which proved to be very successful. Um, it's not easy to get South American paper in the UK, but we seem to have managed to put quite a good sale together, I think, this time. The main highlight of the South American sale this year will be the Ibrahim Salem collection, as most of you probably still know now. We are selling, <coughs> over a period of some years, the Ibrahim Salem collection of World Banknotes. It's the turn of the South American section now. Ibrahim always had an eye for quality, but more importantly, maybe interesting banknotes. Um, and his South American, I think, is a very colourful group. Uh, with lots of countries represented, lots of local scenes, lots of interesting people. We've picked up a few things. Unfortunately, a lot of the really good notes are actually in New York already for viewing. Uh, but I found a few things here. Um, the very nice banknote here with the portrait of Che Guevara. So a very interesting historical figure. Very, very cheap as well. So easy to get some very nice historical notes in the auction. Che Guevara. We've also got um, a note here which was made by the US for the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, so it's a, a Cuban counterfeit as such, but historically fascinating. A nice group of Costa Rica here shows sugar cane cutting, banana picking, coffee, coffee bean picking. So you've got a bit of everything in the sale, real bits of South Americana, real historical characters. And I think something that really, I know Ibrahim Love, because I can remember him telling me he sent his secretary to the Philippines. I should end, mention, by the way, that South America, Philippines and Cuba, the auction. He sent his secretary to Cuba to pick up a, a note. The Philippines made a commemorative 100,000 peso banknote, and they only made a 1,000 of them. Ibrahim, being the sort of fanatical collector that he is, wanted to make sure he got one, and sent his secretary to the Philippines to buy one. And here it is, which is really... A magnificent piece of paper, the 100,000 peso. You can still go to the bank, I believe, and change this for, for cash, although it is, of course, cash. Um, one other thing I think I'd like to mention as well, I say the auction starts with Ibrahim, and then we have a general selection of, of other properties. Recently in the UK, this book here turned up at a, a small auction house with an estimate of a, a few hundred pounds on it. I'm not going to tell you what it sold for, um, but Waterloo, this is the Waterloo book, Waterloo was by far the rarest printer of all the printers in the UK, and in some people's opinion, and probably mine as well, made probably the most attractive banknotes. We have a very nice selection of Waterloo colour trials in the New York sale from countries as diverse as Rhodesia, Canada, um, India, Persia, um, Robert's going to talk about some of the notes in detail. I've been doing this business for, well, several decades, let's say. I have never, ever had a book like this. We've had the smaller Waterloo book, which again, Robert will talk about, which is this house they generally come. Um, this was a unique find, and I'm very glad to say that some of the notes will be in the New York sale. Some of them will be sold in April in London. And we have a fantastic sale in Hong Kong in January, where there will be some other notes. So keep your eyes open on, on all those sales. Anyway, Ibrahim's sale kicks it off. I'm sure it will do well. Ibrahim's collection deserves to do well because he is a true collector. And as I've said many times in my forewords, a banknote collecting titan, which I think is a very good expression for Ibrahim. Anyway, I'll let Robert now talk about some of the specific notes, especially the, the Waterloo colour trials uh, in the sale. Robert, over to you. Thank you very much, Barnaby. Um, yes, well, I shall start off by going into a little bit more detail about the smaller Waterloo book that Barnaby just mentioned. He's covered the larger one, and this smaller one, I think, is perhaps not as, uh, as large in size, but equally significant. And it's a rather charming little thing, as you can see it on the camera. Uh, it's blue with gold lettering, specimens of banknotes uh, produced by the Waterloo and Sons Company. Now, I rather like the little inscription on the top, uh, top left, as you can see it, 
of the book, which says to be kept under lock and key. Now, obviously, Waterloo guarded their specimens and colour trials uh, extremely securely because, obviously, they were the only ones with these things. And um, they were examples uh, within of what only they could do, and they did it very well. So, uh, a very nice little inscription there. It did contain these specimens and colour trials, which we have removed for the purposes of sale. However, this little book itself will actually be offered for sale in New York as well, uh, as its own entity. And uh, hopefully a collector will rather like this little miscellaneous lot, and we've estimated it at three to four hundred dollars. So, um, yeah, a fun little thing to include in our new would also summer. point out, it says to be kept under lock and key. I can assure you that Sphinx have probably got under more locks and keys than Waterloo ever had it, because when Waterloo had it, the notes had no value as such. They were commercial samples. Um, without going into vulgar detail, Waterloo notes are worth quite a lot of money, and we have kept the books severely under lock and key. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. As you say, under many locks and mm. several sort of, uh, yes, uh, several safes. Now, uh, moving on to some of these said colour trials and specimens and other bits and pieces, the first proper note that I'm going to cover is this rather nice West African Currency Board note for uh, 20 shillings dated 1930. Now, those of you who saw my uh, piece to camera for our October sales may remember that I talked very briefly about a Canadian note which featured a picture of uh, the Prince of Wales, of course, later to become Edward VIII. Now, I chose that purely because it was a pretty note and I just liked the design. I've done something very similar with this note. It hasn't got as great a value as some of the later notes that I'm going to talk about, but I actually like the simplicity of the design of this one. As you will see, it has very simply a single palm tree in the centre, um, which basically came to symbolise the West African colonies, and um, hence it is produced on this banknote. And it is a very, very nice thing. For those of you who are, like myself, also interested in military history, it is also well worth noting that the single palm tree was also the uh, regimental cat badge of the West African Frontier Force. So um, I could learn something uh, every day listening to this. Exactly. <laughs> I couldn't talk about banknotes without also adding a bit of military history into it. So a very nice thing indeed. And we have an estimate on this of six to eight hundred dollars. I would just point out very quickly, all these Waterloo notes, the, the interesting and rare thing about them is that they, although they're rare notes in their own right, Waterloo always printed them in different colours. So the salesman couldn't go out and spend them, or if anyone stole the book, they couldn't use them. That's what makes these rare and special. They are standard notes in a completely different colour, so much more, more unusual and very attractive too. Exactly. Now, the next one I'm going to cover is uh, a Rhodesian issue, five pounds, uh, dated 1926. Uh, and I have chosen this, again, because it is incredibly beautiful. Uh, I certainly think so anyway, um, but it also has a price tag to match. So we've estimated this at 1500 to $2,000. Now, as you can see here, it has a fantastic title, which reads, Barclays Bank, Dominion, Colonial and Overseas. And it features various images which really, to me, uh, personify the uh, idea of the British Empire, of course, at the time in the uh, mid-1920s, when certainly in Africa the British Empire was at its height. Now, the note is this lovely red colour with a bit of gold added into it as well. On uh, the left, you can see the... Uh, allegorical seated female here with the very very woolly rams at her feet <laughs> and on the other side there Victoria Falls now along with perhaps an image of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, which of course this doesn't feature those two landmarks Victoria Falls and Kilimanjaro again really sum up or personify uh, the African continent certainly from an empire point of view so again, a very, very strong 
image that we're getting through that. And the reverse, equally nice, uh, perhaps a little bit plainer, but at the bottom centre here, we have this reclining lion. And again, if I can't think of anything else that really symbolises the British Empire in Africa more than a very uh, imperious and proud looking lion. It's, I think, an absolutely superb illustration. Not much of an empire now, though. Is it? it isn't, but yes. it's still a great lion. Exactly. <laughs> whatever you can, whatever yeah. you want to say about the British yeah, Empire, yeah. you can. Yeah. The banknotes were good. Yeah, the the banknotes bank were good. They yeah. knew how to make yeah. a good banknote. Yeah. Yeah. So there we are. So that is Rhodesia covered, and now we go off to the Philippines for this <laughs> Treasury certificate, Victory issue, five hundred peso note from the late 1940s, specifically from 1944. Now, you might have noticed that previous notes that I have chosen have been specimens and colour trials in basically uncirculated condition. This, however, is almost the opposite. It is uh, in rather poor condition. And in fact, if you can see the plastic uh, holder, it is graded only 12, which, as those of you who collect your banknotes will know, is a very low grade indeed. Quite low grade, yes. Quite we're, low. we're trying to sell the bank. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a presentable enough grade. Presentable enough, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But not quite a rag. No, no. Uh, um, anyway, uh, it is rather nice and very unusual, mainly for the reverse, which, as you can hopefully see, has a victory overprint. Now, the reason for this uh, is relating to the Second World War. As you may know, the Philippine Islands were occupied by the Japanese during the war, and in the sort of mid, uh, about 1942 up to 45, certainly into 44, uh, Allied forces fought many, many battles and engagements in and around the Philippines to recapture the islands. Now, in 1944, uh, when American forces under General MacArthur landed at Leyte Island, they brought with them these banknotes in order to help sort of re-energise the local economy and, um, yeah, start to, to put some good money back into it after the uh, Japanese occupation for several years. What I find is actually quite amusing is that uh, these notes, of course, were printed and issued a good five or six months before the islands had been fully recaptured from the Japanese. So the Americans, uh, and indeed the Allies, were clearly very confident that... Uh, they were going to be victorious. A little premature, I think, at the time. Probably. Perhaps a took, little. It took them a little bit longer than I think they thought. Exactly. <laughs> um, so a fascinating bit, again, of banknote history, but also a little bit of military history thrown in. And that's actually from Ibrahim's collection as well, that particular one. It is. Um, and a very nice and rare note it is too. And we have an estimate on this of twelve to $1,800. And uh, we're confident because of that victory overprint that it'll do very well. Going back to a very attractive banknote, or rather a perhaps a set of almost pre-banknotes, I have chosen these uh, Argentinian proofs from the uh, bank of Daniel Gonzalez and Company, uh, which is uh, a rather fun name. Now, this is a little set from the 1860s that basically... Um, printers would put together pieces of art that went into a final banknote uh, when it was produced and fully printed. So these are little examples of how that was done. So here we have a rather, rather splendid condor at the top um, with the colours, the orange and the values at left and right. And then we have little constituent parts of the note. Uh, for example, this piece here, which is red, uh, this was de designed to go on the reverse of the note. Uh, and then we have an example purely of the condor itself. Uh, again, I think this is absolutely stunning. You know, it's a very, very striking image. And certainly when it comes to um, Sort of birds like this, I can't think of a, a more striking image of, uh, of a bird on a banknote. You wouldn't want to be a small lamb on a mountainside, would you, if that was flying over? You absolutely wouldn't. <laughs> uh, and I think, yeah, terrifying and awe-inspiring in equal measure. And um, yeah, 
again, a, a very interesting thing. It's interesting also to note that the, the gentleman who basically uh, wrote the book on Argentinian banknotes um, knows of only, I believe, one of these in issued format uh, that is currently in a private collection. So as issued notes are incredibly rare, and also in this format they are very rare as well. You see more specimens than you do issued notes, which doesn't happen very often. Um, so yeah, a really fun little set that charts the production of a rare note, and we have estimated this at five to seven hundred dollars. And again, we're confident that, that yeah. should peak. I think it just goes to show the the, the the high quality of the artwork that goes into a banknote. Obviously, a banknote has to be printed incredibly well, a to stop forgers, and b it's a, a very good advert for the country that's producing it. So banknote quality tends to be fantastic. So anything with the the original artwork, the vignettes, is um, much sought after, and I think understandably so. They are beautiful things. Yes, exactly. Uh, now, my penultimate note is uh, we're going off from Argentina, from South America, back to Europe, and going to Greece for this 100 drachmae colour trial from 1944. Again, another war year and another 1944. That wasn't actually deliberate, that's just mm -hmm. how it seems to have worked out. So... I have chosen this mainly for the story. Now, on the right there, you can see the portrait of a chap called Constantinos Canaris. I'm going to talk about him very shortly. In the centre, now I really like this, is a ship sinking and on fire, and you can see the flames going up into the main design here and flanked by clouds of smoke. Now, this note tells a story, and it tells the story basically of this chap, Constantinos Canaris. He was uh, a naval officer, a Greek naval officer, during the Greek Wars of Independence in the 1820s, uh, which is also famous uh, over here for being the war that Lord Byron was involved in, and obviously unfortunately died of, died of illness whilst he was out there, but the famous poet Lord Byron, uh, I don't believe he fought with Canaris, but certainly in the same war. So, Canaris was a naval officer fighting against the Ottomans, and the ship in the middle here refers to a particular occasion. The Battle of Chios in uh, about mid-1820s, mid when uh, Canaris sailed a fire ship up to this uh, uh, Turkish warship, uh, in fact the flagship of the uh, Turkish navy, um, and basically set fire to it, and the uh, result was that the Turkish warship uh, blew up uh, with the loss of all hands, including the enemy admiral. So Canaris became very famous for this uh, feat of daring do and great bravery in the face of the enemy, and then went on to lead uh, the Greek naval forces uh, many more times against the um, uh, Turkish navy. He also is quite well known in Greece for later becoming Prime Minister of the country. And my understanding is that I believe he served five terms as Prime Minister of Greece. And he actually died in office as well um, in his mid-80s. So he was uh, a very well-known character at the time. And um, yeah, just a fascinating thing. And I think this sort of banknote really does... Um, exemplify that you can learn a lot of history uh, purely from an illustration. And I, I really, really like it. Doing a trick. E exactly. I wonder whether Admiral Canaris had anything to do with the Canaris and the German Navy. It, it's a very good point. There was an Admiral oh, Canaris. Yeah. Yes. I thought in, I'd throw that yeah, one in and yeah. see what people think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> We'd be in, do tell us. Um, well, I'm going to probably look it up in, in a moment when I get back to my desk. So there we go. And we have an estimate of five to seven hundred dollars on this. And we meant no disrespect to the Turkish Navy, because we do have some very nice Turkish notes in our April sale in London. So please, <laughs> no offence meant. We are not partisan or mercenary. No, 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 we're just bank notes. Yeah, exactly. We're just trying to sell the bank notes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, my final note that I have perhaps left the best till last is this Costa Rican uh, colour trial for two colonies from 1931. Now this is um, this has got a lot of people very excited. 
because, uh, well, first of all, it is if you have a collection of South American banknotes, this is po possibly the one that you would want to have in your collection. It is very, very famous indeed for the Mona Lisa image at the centre. And in fact, that is the uh, image we have chosen for the front cover of our catalogue, which you will see when it is published. And it's also quite amusing because this sale has not one, not two, but three examples of this banknote. They are not common, by the way. We should stress that just <laughs> because we have three doesn't mean they're common. They are very good notes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we only have three because uh, I think we, we are... We couldn't get four. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a particularly nice example of the specimen note. And um, it is, as I said, if you like collecting your South American notes, it is the one that you'll want to have in your collection. So we are confident that it'll do extremely well. And we're making sure to, you know, make a big deal out of this. I also think it's quite amusing talking about the number of notes that, you know, not only do we have three of these, um, but we have two Waterloo albums, um, as we mentioned at the start. And so I suppose it's a bit like buses, really, isn't it? You know, you wait for a long time for one to turn up, then... You we know, don't want time. anyone thinking they're common, because they're not, no. 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 I would like no. to ask you a question and put you on the spot. Why is Mona Lisa on a Costa Rica banknote? <laughs> It's actually something that's very difficult to mm. find out. I've tried to do, tried and failed to do a fair amount so of research. So you don't know. This. Oh, sorry, I didn't uh, mean to put I you on the spot. I just thought you were going to come up with a fascinating fact, which I didn't know anything about. And I'm just always curious why Mona Lisa is, is there. Yeah. Um, in fact, not many people seem to know the reason why. The only bit of information I could find out is that the bank decided that they didn't want a South American hero on their note, basically, because previous notes generally cover, um, you know, liberators of the country mm. or, you know, sort of people like Simon Bolivar. Um, and then they decided we'll go completely sort of left field and choose the Mona Lisa. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what they did. However, not many people liked it very much. So they soon went back to... Um, but we do. Sort of ex well, we Which is why it's much. on the cover. And I think it works very well. Too. Exactly. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. lots of other people will like yeah. it as well. Uh, and we have an estimate on this particular specimen of two to three thousand dollars. Uh, and we, again, we expect a lot of interest and hopefully to do better than that. Uh, so that uh, covers my uh, my little um, yeah. contribution. Well, thank you, Robert. Yeah, I think just to summarise, basically, it's it's not often that we can do a sale of South American paper. It's rather like asking an American company to do a sale of British paper. I would be very surprised and not a little annoyed, too, <laughs> as to why it didn't come over to us. Anyway, this is the second year we've managed to put a sale together, and I think mainly due to Ibrahim's collection and to the fortuitous finding of two extraordinarily rare Waterloo books, I think we've got quite an interesting sale uh, coming up in New York. So, as I say, I hope you'll enjoy the catalogue and uh, there'll be some spirited bidding for, for the banknotes in the sale. It's a very varied, colourful collection and it deserves to do well. Uh, I should point out that, as I said before, we have a, a very, very good sale in Hong Kong in January, which has got several exceptional notes from this Waterloo album in and of course April in conjunction with the Maastricht Paper Money Show we will hopefully have a very good world sale which will again be featuring some of Ibrahim Salim's Commonwealth banknotes which would be hard to beat I think. So Robert thank you and um, thank you for watching and hopefully we'll see your bids coming in shortly. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.